Well, this session is the third of three, the final one, if you will, on Romans chapter 8. We're going through the epistle to the Romans, which is regarded by many as perhaps the most precious book of the Bible, because it's the definitive statement of Christian doctrine, written by one of the brightest men that has ever walked the planet Earth. Paul was an incredible logician and otherwise. People who have studied his writings are overwhelmed with the precision of his logic and the rest of it. So it's, a very, it's, it's, it's his capstone piece, if you will. Some people call it the gospel according to Paul. But the epistle of the Romans. And of the book of Romans, the high ground, the peak, the pinnacle, is chapter 8. There's 16 chapters. The first eight are doctrinal. And the rest, uh, then the next the three will have to do with Israel and some other things, are dispensational. And then the rest are practical ones. But this is the high ground, Romans 8. And you'll see why what I'm about to say is true as we get through the evening. But you might just make a mental note. If you're ever down, if you're ever discouraged, if some radio preacher has confused you or whatever, me included, if you ever get down for any reason, just remember Romans 8. Jump right into Romans 8. If you're lazy, jump in the middle and take the last half. But the whole thing is phenomenal. Incredible, incredible chapter. But what it deals with, especially near the end, is a topic that has divided the Christian body for better than four centuries. The doctrine of eternal security. Can you lose your salvation? How many have been asked that question or asked it themselves sometime recently? It's a common question. And you'll find good scholars giving you different answers to that. And I'm going to suggest to you it's a very important question. There are two of the most important questions in your life, theologically speaking, that we're going to be dealing in this uh, study. That's one of them. Yeah, I'll get to the other one later. But uh, it's important to understand. And don't accept your view because of my articulation of the arguments. Develop your view from your knowledge of the Scripture. Anchor your belief, whatever it is, in the Word of God. That's where it should be anchored anyway. But we're going to explore this in chapter 8. Now, just by way of review, the first two chapters leveled the playing field. They introduced the book, and they dealt with three human predicaments, the pagan man, the moral man, the religious man. In effect, pointing out they're all lost. The pagan man, the, the creation itself is sufficient to indict him, condemn him. That's enough to hold us accountable, by which we fail. The moral man. We all know people that seem to live exemplary lives. They don't go to church. They're not religious. But boy, they're clean people. And we think, boy, they have it made. It turns out that ain't so. Even the moral men. Don't, they, no matter how moral they might be, they don't stand up to God's standard. That's the point. I'm not here to denigrate them, but that's basically Paul's point. The third Man is a person that's religious, and he uses as an, an exemplar the Jew, the devout Jew. He keeps the law, sort of, and yet he deals with that. And the net net of the first two chapters is that we are all lost because we have a genetic defect. We're not HIV positive, I hope, but we're SIN positive. It's a genetic defect, and there is a blood remedy for it, <laughs> shed blood for that. So that led to the biggest problem. Can you imagine God having a problem? You think of God, he didn't have any problems. Yes, he had a huge problem. Because he couldn't violate his nature, which is justice, and yet he, wanted, he loved us enough to want to save us. And so how, that, his biggest problem is how do you solve that? That's very problematical. It's, it's casual only if you don't understand his righteousness and you don't understand our degree of sinless. That gulf is huge. How does, how does God deal with that without being inappropriately lenient and by having it paid? And that's why I, you get to the greatest gift. The greatest gift. God's great, greatest problem is solved by the greatest gift possible. And that gift is summarized. I, like, I love the way my friend Hal Lindsey summarizes it. He uses the letter grace, G-R-A-C-E. Okay? God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ paid the price so the Father could wipe our slate clean. He did it all. So one of the first questions we're going to deal with tonight as we get into the material is can you lose your salvation? If your salvation depends on you, yes, you can. You can lose your salvation. It depends on you. Mine doesn't. Mine depends on Christ. So 
It's a little it's a trick question and a trick answer, perhaps, but that's very true. God's riches at Christ's expense. I love the way how he uses that as a mnemonic, but it's, I think, very effective. The fifth chapter was the sequence to maturity, going from tribulation to patience to, to perseverance to hope. Hope is the, the hope is at the top, strangely enough. Then we get to chapter 6 that most people are shocked by, that sin no longer need reign in your life. Oh, you mean I can be sinless? No, I didn't say that. But you have a choice now. You have the power to avoid sin. You have the power to be sinless if you will walk by the Spirit. Yeah, you will just stumble here and there. Yeah, probably. But you have the... Before being regenerate, before being saved, you didn't have. You were a bondage to sin and death. But if you're in Christ, you no longer are. And that's what chapter 6... It ain't, sin ain't going to reign no more. It may get you aware here and there, but it won't be in control. That led to chapter 7, law school. What was the purpose of it? Is the law faulty? No, not at all. The law's purpose is to show us our need, not to fulfill that need. There's a difference. And, and the law school chapter is classic for that reason. But that just set up, if you will, the chapter we're now in, which I would call the high watermark of Romans. And it's going to be another way to look at the book, another way of backing off to give you an overview of the book is the Trinity. God the Father is the focus of the first three chapters, one through about three, verse 20. God the Son, who provided the salvation, grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. He paid the price. I'm not deminimizing the, the role of the Father in his forbearance. Anybody that's been a father and has seen their son in emergency ward being worked on by doctors knows that he would gladly have changed places if he could have. One of the most astonishing analyses is to think through the role of the father as he stood back and allowed these jerks to spit on him, insult him, torture him, nail him to that cross, and so forth. But God the Son... Is chapters 3 through 7. God the Holy Spirit is the subject of the rest of the book because he's the comforter that was sent. As Jesus left us, he left us. He didn't leave us comfortless. He left the Holy Spirit here. And our biggest challenge in life, moment to moment, is understanding and appropriating the resources of the Holy Spirit to accomplish our sanctification, whatever that means. Okay. Romans opened up and said, the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. I just want to pick one verse from the first to summarize what we had there. That summarized the whole previous chapter, chapter 7. While the law of sin and death will be with us as long as we are in this body, it doesn't necessarily have to have dominion over us. That's the big difference. We have a choice. The law of the spirit of life. Different law. Chuck, you're under the law. Yes, and not the law you are, this, this law. I'm not under the law of the Torah. I'm under the law of the Spirit. They're different. One, this one's far more demanding, actually. But it also has the empowering. See, and, and it's a genitive case. The law principle of the life-giving Spirit is what it really says. And this is, this is abiding in Jesus Christ. We'll hear more and more about this. This is abiding in Him, the organic union that we have. That's why we collectively are called, what, the body of Christ. Body of Christ. Don't confuse that with the bride of Christ. That's a little homework assignment. What's the difference between the bride of Christ and the body of Christ? They're not the same thing. Ooh. That's a deep one. Let's move on. Okay. And we talked about in the, in the middle chunk of Romans 8, why do Christians have trials? Everybody notice Christians have trials? Once you're Christian, you don't have any more trials, right? Wrong. Okay. You have trials to glorify God. You do get occasionally for discipline for known sin, to prevent us from falling into sin, to keep us from pride. Paul is a good example of that, the thorn in his flesh. By the way, I found out something in the Greek. It isn't thorn in the flesh. That's a polite, a, uh, yeah, it's a euphemism of the King James. It's a pain in the neck or lower. Some people have a low, even a lower opinion, but then we go on. Build faith, cause growth, teach obedience and discipline, equip us to comfort others, prove the reality of Christ in us. Ooh. And also as a testimony to angels. We talked about each one of those in the previous session. You go through the notes. This is by way of review. 
the first 13, we had our uh, verses of Romans 8, we had our deliverance from the flesh. The next few verses, we had the realization of our sonship. Our sonship. The prodigal son blew his inheritance, but he didn't lose his sonship. We have the opportunity to lose our inheritance by not being faithful, but we don't lose our sonship. Even if we're adopted under the old Roman and Hebrew laws, you were adopted, that was irreversible. Irreversible. In fact, even if you're a firstborn son, you were adopted at the right age to become officially the heir, even though you may be born into it. Not until you were adopted because you were able to inherit. Once you're adopted, you can never be disowned. That's an important thing, especially for tonight's lesson. Remember that. Then the next few verses, why do Christians suffer? We went through that. We're really in a boot camp for heaven. You know, if you're in the military, any one of the services, you go through the equivalent of a boot camp, and indoctrination training and so forth. And you endure a lot of that stuff because you have a good grasp of the fact that what you're going through there will prepare you for, for the real stuff that's coming. And that's exactly true with us. Our life from birth to death is a boot camp for heaven. And I think there's the reason I think I have this view that most of the people that go to heaven are going to be disappointed. Not that they're in heaven. Don't misunderstand me. They're going to be grateful for that. But it won't be what they expected. Because we've been all taught by preachers and stuff that we're all going to be at the wedding supper and we're all going to reign with Christ. No, 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 no. That's the bride of Christ. Those are the ones that have been faithful. And I think when we realize that we're in heaven all right, but we didn't avail ourselves of a faithful walk while we we're on the earth and we have forfeited the kind of inheritance that could have been us, that's where the weeping and gnashing of teeth come in. Not from people who are unsaved. They're already taken care of. No, we're talking about something else. Check it out. Don't take my word for it. So we're in chapter, we're in the last part of the, the uh, thing here. Eternal security and predestination versus free will. Boy, those problems have plagued philosophers from the beginning of time. If things are predestined, do we really have free will? Or if we have really have free will, how could they be predestined? That sounds like it's a contradiction. It's only a contradiction when viewed from within the time domain. We were in, in the, uh, 18 to 30 last time, so today we're going to focus on eternal security and this predestination issue. Last time we finished about verses 16 and 17, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Ooh, we have no capacity to imagine what that means. For everybody, no, no. Then it says, if, uh, this is a conditional reward. If so be that we suffer with him. See, not everybody in heaven is going to necessarily be a joint heir or will achieve the inheritance that's set aside for them. Depends how faithful your walk is. Yes, that's works. Not to be saved, but to gain your inheritance. There are different issues. And so many that arrive in heaven will be disappointed. And if that doesn't shock you, you weren't listening carefully. That's serious stuff. Inheritance. There are different kinds of inheritance in both the Old and the New Testament. Inheritance can mean several things. Among them is a reward for a life of faithfulness. And that's really what we're talking about here. Yes, you inherit, but you inherit if the Father deems you faithful. There are lots of sons in the Old Testament that were firstborn, set to inherit, that didn't. Esau is an example. The classic example, there are others. Reuben's another one. Jesus achieved his inheritance by persevering in suffering. And that's exactly what the writer to Hebrews says in chapter 2 and the letter to Philippians emphasizes. That even Jesus earned his inheritance by performance. His companions will inherit the same way. Same way he did. By what? By faithful performance. Now inheritance can be forfeited. We need to understand that. As Christians, we somehow assume that just because we have this free, uh, get out of hell free card, our passport stamp to enter heaven, that, that, boy, that's it. I'm sure glad that's taken care of. We ignore the fact that there's a Bema seat judgment coming that's going to give out rewards. Most of us go through life with the idea, well, gee, if I'm there, that's all I want to worry about. Maybe right now, when you get there, you might have a different outlook. You wish, boy, I could have, I could have really taken better advantage of my opportunities. The only way inheritance can be gained is through perseverance and faithful service. And when you get to Romans chapter 8, you want to put a tab or a marker or something on verse 28 because that will allow you to check it about once a day. Okay. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Not everybody, not everybody, 
We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom God did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Wow. And then it goes on, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Good question. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather it is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. This is just the overview of where we're headed. We'll go through this here in a minute. And then it goes on to the big wrap-up. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are what? More than conquerors. The more than. Oh, Paul, more than. More than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Boy, heavy stuff. Now, Romans 8, 28, the most, three most important words of that verse are the first three. Going back, picking this up, and going through it a little more carefully. We know that all things work together. We don't hope. We don't suspect. We don't surmise. No, no, we know. This verse has power to you if you know that. We know that all things, most things, no, all things, all things work together. Really? When trouble comes your way, when some huge setback hits you right between the eyes, that's, God, that's Father filtered. If you're a Christian, there's a reason for it. You may not see it. And I like to summarize, I think every day God finds another way to ask us the question, do you trust me? Every day God finds a different way to ask that question, do you trust me? No, we know that all things work together for good to everybody? No, to them who love God, who, them are, who are the called. Definite article is very important. Who are the called according to his purpose. Sanctification, we've talked about justification. Justification is by faith alone, by believing Christ, you are justified, your passport stamped, okay to enter. You haven't changed, but you are now clear. You are not guilty. It separates you from the penalty of sin. It doesn't separate you from the power of sin. That's what sanctification is all about. Justification declares you righteous. You're categorized legally as righteous. You haven't changed yet. Sanctification is the intent there is to make you righteous. And beginning from regeneration, being born again, to its completion and glorification, sanctification is the final thing is to get you glorified. We'll get to that. It's ultimately whose work? God's work. Now you have to be a participant, but it's God's work, and you appropriate it by faith. That's Philippians 1.6. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. The works together is active voice, present tense of the verb, synergy. It emphasizes that this is a continuing activity of God, is what it's saying. It's a continuing activity of God. It takes continual external inputs to coordinate the process. We need to understand that, by the way. Let me pause for a minute and talk about an analogy that might be useful. Let's imagine that every one of us in this room could play any instrument of an orchestra. You all have the skills to play any instrument that's involved. And there's plenty of instruments around. If I handed you a complete copy of the symphony, each one had their own copy, each one had an instrument that you could play, would you have a symphony? No. What was missing? A conductor. Put it in design terms, someone has to supply the conflict resolution logic. Somebody has to say, you're going to be first violin, you're going to be percussion, you're going to assign the roles and get it organized. You follow me? If you study the DNA from an information science point of view, and that's what it's all about, by the way, microbiology has gone from biology really to the information sciences. That's the frontier of that whole world. From an information science point of view, the fact that your DNA completely describes you 
They're just one cell. It, you can produce your DNA, and that DNA it can end up reproducing you in a, in a, in a reproductive process. It completely describes That's what Jurassic Park dramatizes a novel. The piece of information will create a creature. Having the DNA alone ain't enough. Because it turns out from an information science point of view, it takes external input. You've got cells that are a single cell that's dividing, right? One becomes two, then four, then eight. And they're stem cells. They're undifferentiated. But then pretty soon they start differentiating. Some of them become bone uh, tissue. Some become cortical tissue. Some become muscle, whatever. And they become organs. Now, wait a minute. Who told them which one was going to do what? If two cells split, how do they split identically? And then again, identically. You, know, you follow me? There's something missing, isn't there? There is a view held by some scientists that God is involved in every cell division. An external input is required. And that's exactly what's going on here, is that this term, he works together. We know that all things work together. No, he works together. That It takes continual external inputs to accomplish the sanctification. Now, every cell division in the human zygote, having complete coding in each cell is not enough. You need con what's called in the computer field conflict resolution logic. Somebody has to be the quarterback. Follow me? You don't just field a team of skilled players. You need somebody to be the quarterback to define roles and missions. The called. We know that all these work together. Forget remember, the called according to his purpose. The word is kletos. It means to be summoned to. Divinely selected and appointed. Are you divinely selected and appointed? Appointed? Apparently. Hope so. If so, you can take comfort in this verse. The example is Joseph. 13 years in prison, sold out by his family, his own brothers? You think he had some down moments? Man. And yet he perceived. They meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He's the one that when he glorified, you know, this, this incredible story. You need to review that from time to time. So our issue that we're going to be joining here is eternal security. Can a man lose his salvation? That's the big question that lurks behind many discussions today. Yes, you can lose your salvation if it depends on the person asking the question. The Arminian, there's two major views. The Arminian denies that a true child of God is eternally secure. The Arminian point of view is that you better persevere to the end or you're not really saved. Well, that makes your salvation a result of your energy and efforts and what have you. But that is the Arminian view. And there are many, many churches that really come out of that tradition. They would argue that unless you persevere, you're not really saved. Well, the other view is the Calvinist view. Calvinists insist that if he does not per persevere to the end, that just proved he wasn't saved in the first place. So he sort of argues the same way for different reasons. He sort of stands back and, well, you're saved? Well, I'll watch and see. If you get to the end of your life and if you persevered, then yeah, I guess you were saved. And some of the theologians will call that view the experimental predestinarians. You're predestinated, but you don't find out until you get there that you were predestinated. It's sort of like trying to find the address you're going to by watching the rearview mirror somehow. But you'll, for, for 400 years, most church theologians have been in one camp or the other. They're either Arminian, because you've really got to, I know it's, salvation's free, but you've really got to earn it. And that contradiction never gets quite resolved. The Calvinist goes the other way around. If you're saved, it's because you were predestinated from the beginning. Well, how do you know? Well, we'll find out when you get there. When you get there, whoops. You know. One of the things my wife and I are writing a book on is a, a way between these two. Because they're both correct in what they assert, and they're both wrong in what they deny. And there's a path between these two. And that's the path we're going to try to touch on lightly in this study. See, there have been 400 years of doctrinal disputes with outstanding scholars on both sides. You can't fault these people. They're bright people. But we think this has occurred because the failure to distinguish between justification, that's why we don't generally use the word salvation. Salvation consists of three things. Justification, sanctification, glorification. What we usually mean by salvation is justification. God is justified in letting you into heaven. You've got your passport to get in. Here it is. No one can take it away from you. That's certain. Why? Because Christ paid for it all. We haven't talked about sanctification yet. Sanctification is a whole other issue. 
And we need to discern the difference there to understand much of what the scripture has to tell us. And the sanctification is going to show up in our different inheritances when we get to the Bema Seat of Christ. Some people will be sovereign, some will be subjects. But they'll all be in heaven, yes, but with different roles and missions. But okay. We'll discover as we get into the next few chapters a word that shows up in the Greek called the metakoi. The true child of God is obligated to persevere. That's Paul's word. In, in fact, it shows up first in Romans 8. He's the partaker. If koinonos is the path, the metakoi is the guy who's arrived, in a sense of speaking. He's the one that's actually participated. He has suffered with Christ. He is, he hasn't just, he's been a doer of the word, not a hearer only. If the metakoi fails to persevere, he doesn't lose salvation. He does not forfeit his justification, but he justifies some of his inheritances. He may face discipline in time. He will lose his reward at the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat as we call it. But the real point we're going to get into here is that all three persons of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are preserving us through to completion or fruition that which God has already determined. Now that may shock many theologians to really apprehend that. That you may not, if you're, if you're saved, your perseverance is guaranteed by God. You may not make it the first time around. You know, I'm reminded when in the Naval Academy, obviously you have to pass swimming tests. And some guys go through the test, they manage it. There's always a few that just don't. So they go to remedials, and they finally learn to swim. But boy, what they go through to finally get qualified, uh, you wouldn't wish on your, your worst friend, you know. Because you're going to, you're, you're Naval Academy, you're going to swim before you graduate. But anyway, we're going to leave the specific commitments here, some of these commitments in this chapter, and some of them are going to come up in the subsequent chapters. But what we really want to get at is the basis. If I'm going to take a position on eternal security, what's the basis? Well, it depends on three people, and you're not one of them. It depends on God the Father. Let's talk about him first. It depends upon his sovereign purpose. Why did God save you in the first place? His eternal purpose is declared in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. He, it was anchored within the veil of the temple, confirmed by oath according to Hebrews 6. His solemn purpose, he had a sovereign purpose as God, he has a solemn purpose. Our salvation depends upon his promise and not our faithfulness. Our salvation depends upon his promise. We're going to look at some of those promises carefully. Romans 4, back there in chapter 4. Therefore it is of faith. What does that mean? Nothing on man's part. That might be by grace. That's everything on God's part. Faith is your part. Grace is his part. Your part is zero. Just accepting it. You have to accept it, yes. But you don't do anything. If, you do, if you're doing something for that gift, you're insulting the giver to the end that the promise might be sure. See, if you can screw it up, you will. God has designed this so that you can't mess it up. I love that part of it. If it depended on any point in human ability to continue to believe, then the promise could not be secure. I believed once, I don't now. Okay. If you have to continue to believe, there are some people that hold that view, that means your security is dependent upon your performance. That's not what I had read in the scripture, and I'll show you why in a minute. The promise that those who believe will be saved is confirmed end to end in the scripture as early as Genesis 15, 6. And if you haven't learned it yet, memorize John 3, 16. And right on through. It goes on. You can't even list them all. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. That's the promise. Very simple. No footnotes, no conditions. It depends upon his infinite power. Is God able to deliver? We know what his purpose is, both as sovereign and also his promised commitment. He is free to save us. Nothing can hinder God. He's free to save us. Christ's death has rendered God free to save us in spite of moral imperfection. We're imperfect. Hate to be the one to break the news to you, but we're imperfect. But God can view us as perfect because Christ paid up the difference. He took care of it. Our eternal security does not depend upon our own moral worthiness, right? Okay, if our first being saved didn't depend on our moral perfection, why should our completion have to be? 
That doesn't mean if we're not complete, we don't lose something like inheritance, but we're still saved. Because Christ is the propitiation, the payment for, the provision for our sins. If you assume that there's some sin sufficiently serious which causes us to forfeit our salvation, that's to assume that we were less worthy of salvation after having committed the sin than before. He, God, has purposed to keep us saved in John 6.39. We're going to look at a couple of verses here that will really nail it as far as I'm concerned. John 6.37 and following. Jesus speaking. This is Jesus himself. He says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. That's interesting. Right there. If you come to Christ, it's because the Father has given you to him. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, him. To me, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Boy, that's a comfort, right? Nothing prevents you from coming to Christ. The Calvinists will say, well, you can only go if you're predestinated. Well, I'm going to set him aside for the moment. Here it says, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. If you can lose your salvation, God loses more than you do. You lose your salvation, he loses his good name. And I think that's worth more to him than anything else. That doesn't compute. But he's not through here. Jesus says, I should lose none. He always puts a footnote, the exception of course is Judas. That was a predestined exception that he notes. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's Christ's promise. Do you believe it? I do. I do. But this is my dandy. This is the ones I really enjoy. John chapter 10. Remember John 10. Again, Jesus speaking, he says, And I give unto them eternal life. And by the way, if what he gives you can be forfeited, it ain't eternal. If he gives you eternal life, that's for a long time. Okay? And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall, what? Hardly ever per perish. Right? You know what it says? They shall never perish. Never perish. I'm going to come back to that phrase in a minute. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Do you see a hand? Who's sitting in his hand? You are, but he's not finished yet. You're in Christ's hand, idiomatically speaking, right? Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, right? Some of you say, well, you can pluck yourself out. I don't think so. I think when it says any man, that includes me. I can't do it either. I may mess things up. I may forfeit some inheritance. I may mess up some plans he has for me if I would just be faithful. I can mess that up. People do mess up. Me too, especially. <laughs> Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, he says. But then he goes on. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Do you realize this little passage has two hands involved? The only way I can visualize it is like this. You know? I don't think anything can successfully extract us out of their combined hands for sure. Actually, out of either one of them, but you can get the point I'm trying to make. Okay. Can't, out of my hand or out of my father's hand? There are two hands involved here. The word shall never perish in the Greek is a double negative. In the English, a double negative is a verboten. You can't do that. Double negatives are inappropriate in Greek grammar, in uh, English grammar. In Greek, it's a way of being emphatic. We don't want non-know-how. Doesn't work in English exactly, but it does in Greek. It's, a, it's an, a way of emphasis. And the shall never in the Greek is a double negative, which is emph uh, you know, especially emphatic. Now, by the way, if somebody tells me that there's a way I can lose my salvation... I will probably give him the kind of remark that I would expect from a Walter Martin, who's a dear friend. I didn't get this from Walter, but I'll blame him for it. 
If, if you can lose your salvation, I've got a new name for God. You know what it is? Butterfingers. And of course, I'm being irreverently facetious here. As only Walter could be at times. That's why I'm blaming him for this kind of approach. But I like that term. Because it dramatizes what we're trying to say. If you can lose your salvation, then God has fumbled it. Because Jesus himself says it's in his, his Father's hand as well as his own. See, to me, that's enough. But let's go on. So it depends upon his sovereign purpose, his solemn purpose, his infinite power. Oh, and upon his much more love. His intent, God's intent, the Father's intent, is love-based. That's what we had in Romans 5. We went through all of that there. Let's re refresh your memory. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Really? Boy, that shatters limited atonement, doesn't it? You know, the Calvinists would say that he died only for the people that are saved. Well, that's not what the Scripture says. Christ died for the ungodly. That's all of us, actually. God gives us all of the world that he gave his only begotten son. Anyway, for scarcely a righteous man will one die, but peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God, the Father is motivated by love. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life. The much more, much more, again. See, God knew when he saved us that we were totally depraved. And therefore any new manifestation of sin in our lives after our conversion cannot be any motivation to God to change his mind and withdraw his grace and his salvation. I love the way uh, uh, Charles Spurgeon says it. We'll see a verse here in a minute that uh, God picked us before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1.4. We'll look at it in a minute. But I, I always think of that. Spurgeon is the one that apparently said, I'm glad he picked me back then because if he saw me now, he might change his mind. And he's being facetious, of course. <laughs> see, God saved us for reasons that are independent of us, that are outside of us. He's got his own agenda. And part of the discovery we'll be spending an eternity to understand is why did he bother? He had his reasons. And it's explained in the seventh verse of Ephesians 2. So you can check that out in your Ephesians 2 7 tells you why did he bother? So that in the ages yet to come he could manifest his love by his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So God is motivated by electing love and not by observation of good in the sinner. There's a fifth reason why it depends on God the Father, and that's because of his answer to the prayer of his Son. Does God answer the prayers of Jesus? I think we could bank on that, right? Believers are called by many things in Scripture. Saints, believers, elect, sheep, partakers, what have you, right? But the title that's most dear to the heart of Christ isn't saints, believers, elect, sheep, partakers. No, no. The term he uses seven times in his prayer to his father in John 17. Seven times he speaks of us, those whom thou hast given me. You know, it's interesting. I think all of us have this experience, either with our wife or maybe our parents. They've given us some little gift that may, in itself may not be that big a deal, but it's dear to us because it came from them. You all can conjure up a picture of something at home that's dear to you specially because, not because of its intrinsic value, but because of who gave it to you. Christ appears to talk about us that way because we're the Father's gift to him. The title most dear to Christ is those whom thou hast given me. Not once or twice, seven times. In the most intimate passage in the entire Bible, isn't the Lord's Prayer in the Sermon on the Mount? That really should be called the Disciples' Prayer. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. He gives them a prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer. It should be called the Disciples' Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is chapter 17. And when you're ready for a serious, intimate time, sit down privately where you won't get interrupted and pour yourself into John 17. It's the one time you hear the Son commune with his Father. But seven times in that prayer, he speaks of us as those whom thou hast given me. 
And I summarize this whole passage in here by suggesting that the father always answers the prayers of his son. And the son in that prayer, by the way, passes the responsibility of our perseverance from himself to his father. And the father accepts it. Ooh, that's kind of fun. Let's take a look at John 17. He says, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Jesus speaking of himself. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou hast gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Verse 9, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Boy, that's an interesting line. Jesus doesn't pray for the world. No, no, no. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. In other words, out of the world. For they are thine. Now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those that whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Wow. You mean we can be as one with Christ as Christ is with the Father? Those are wild words to absorb. But I come to thee, Father. You keep through thine own name. He's he assigning the responsibility to the Father. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I, I have kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. Wow. Father, I will they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. This is the son talking to the father. Just a few little excerpts from this chapter that I had to throw in here. Seven times of those who have given me. This keeping of the Father is from perishing. That's the context of the passage. From here now we go to a chain of, as if that isn't enough, we're going to go to a chain of five links. Two verses. Two, now we've got through verse 20. We got through 838. Now we're through 2930. A chain of five links. God's sovereign purpose is exemplified in these two verses, 8, uh, 829 and 830. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's where Spurgeon makes his classic. God chose me before I was born. I'm glad he did. Otherwise, they might have changed his mind. I like that. <laughs> Uncertainty about election can arise only from some kind of self-righteousness, by the way. I'll let you think that one through a little bit. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. That's a link of five chains. It's unbroken. That assures that not only assures your justification, it assures your sanctification. But so we do it the short way, not the long way. This eternal choice and foreknowledge involves more than establishing a relationship between God and believers. It's far more involved than that. It involves the certainty of our sanctification. And that's a huge topic we'll come to later in another session. Those whom God foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed to what? That's your destiny, to be conformed to the likeness of his son. God's going to find a way to shape you, mold you, make that happen. So he, whom he foreknow, he predestinated. Whom he predestinated, he called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified. Those are the five links. And the Holy Spirit, we suspect, had in mind the patriarchs. Because from God's knowledge, he predestinated Abraham. Then, then he called Isaac. And that term is used in three different places. Genesis 21, it's also built up in Hebrews eleven eighteen, And it'll come up in Romans in the next chapter we'll get into. And then Isaac, we get to Jacob. And if, if God can justify Jacob, that conniver. Let me ask you a question. Would you buy a used car from Jacob? He was a, he was a conniver, a heel catcher. But God justified him. And, of course, Joseph is the exemplar. There's over a hundred ways in the story of Joseph that it speaks of Christ as an exemplar, as a type. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Joseph, predestinate, called, justified, and glorified. The pattern is there for those that want to go study that. Forno simply means that's where it starts in God's knowledge. The entire group of these are brought into God's eternal plan by divine foreknowledge, and the choice is predestined, predetermined. How can God do that? Because he's outside time. He knows, what he, he knows what choice you're going to make before you make it. Does that mean you're not free to know? You can make any choice you like. He just happens to know what it is. The dice are loaded, so to speak. Okay. 
Ephesians chapter 1, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after what? The counsel of his will. So predestinated simply means planned in advance. That's no fancy, just a fancy word for meaning planned in advance. Your destiny is planned in advance. It picks up a few verses later in Ephesians 1. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us Unto the adoption of children or sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. He's predestinated us to be accepted in Christ. The call, that's simply a call to come to him. And we read that, we read that in uh, John 10 earlier. And justified, that's what Romans 5 was all about. There is therefore now, we're all justified not by works of the, uh, the flesh and so forth. And then glorification. Those he also glorified, and, and so forth. Romans 8.30. So these things are really an echo of those verses, and you can go through that through your notes. We're running out of time here. This is basically a clear statement of the eternal security of the saints. An unbreakable link of five, chain, five links here. What's the goal? That the resurrected and glorified Christ would become the head of a new race of humanity. That, of course, won't happen until the end of the millennium purified from all contact with sin and prepared to live eternally in his presence. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 will detail near the end. It's astounding for us to consider that God's plan of salvation for people is a program that reaches from eternity past, before the earth was shaped, to eternity future. And God is going to carry out that plan perfectly. I have searched the scriptures all the way through and I cannot find the word whoops. God doesn't make mistakes. So recognize we now encounter seven questions. That's the big finish here. The first couple are in verse 31. It basically the questions they ask is can opposition defeat the Christian? Well, yeah, can opposition defeat you? Well, let's see what Paul says about that. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Answer that one. If God's on your side, who can be against you? The if there is the first class condition in the Greek, it's since. Okay, I won't go through the four classes again. And obviously, Satan and his hosts are against believers. You may have noticed. Anyone that doesn't believe in Satan should try opposing him for a while. But we, if you, Ephesians 6 is your remedy, you can dig that out on your own. But Satan and his hosts cannot ultimately prevail and triumph over believers. That's the commitment of God in the scripture. God is the self-existent sovereign creator. Since he is for believers, no one can oppose believers successfully. You may get hassled, but you, they, your victory is yours. Okay, the next question is, will we have the resources? Good question. Let's see what Paul says. He that even spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us most things? Is that what it says? All things. That's a very important word. And by the way, both the King James and the Revised failed to translate the Greek particle gay. It really should be he that not, he, not he that spared, he that even spared not his own son. Small point, but it's emphatic, okay? The word spare... Emphasato is the same word as used in the Septuagint in uh, Genesis chapter 22 when Abraham didn't withhold his son on, on the Mount of Moriah. He didn't withhold his son. He didn't spare his son. Same term here. God that did not spare his own son. The, the linkage is deliberate between this expression in Romans 8 verse 32 and the offering of Isaac in Genesis 22 verse 12. God offered his own son on that very spot as a sacrifice for sin, and Abraham knew he was doing that. That's why he named the place prophetically. In fact, it was his belief in the resurrection of Isaac, the writer to Hebrews tells us in Hebrews eleven nineteen, that is what saved him. Since God sacrificed his own son, he will not hesitate to give believers all things pertaining and leading to their ultimate sanctification. So that makes sense. Next question was, okay, will our failures reverse our justification? No. You may lose some inheritance, but you won't lose your justification. How do I know that? Paul says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. In other words, the, the judge, the fix is in. <laughs> okay? The word charge here is a, is a formal legal term to press charges, if you will. 
Satan is identified, of course, the word Hasatan, Satan is, is the accuser. That's why when I see some of these radio ministers accuse other radio ministers, that's accusing the brethren. I know where that doctrine comes from. Satan is identified as the accuser of God's people. If someone's accusing God's people, I don't care who he is, he's doing Satan's work. Now, Satan's accusations are valid. They're not false. Some of them are slander, but they're valid because they're based on the believer's sinfulness and defilement, and we are sinful. Satan's accusation will be thrown out of court because it's God that justified. The fix is in. Our defense counsel's father is the judge, is a way of looking at it. Okay? The accused person is righteous on the basis of his faith in Jesus Christ. Christ has paid the tab. As a result, all accusations are dismissed, and no one can bring an accusation that will stand. That's the way Romans chapter 1 opens the first verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It opens up with no condemnation. It closes with there is no separation from Christ, as you'll see here in a minute. Okay, the next question is, can anyone condemn us for any reason at all? These are the questions that are implied by the rhetorical the ones that Paul puts up. Now, I said it depends on God the Father, it depends on God the Son. We now enter the third person. Or the, the Son, I should the, the, enter the Son. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, that rather is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also is our chief defense counsel, who also maketh intercession for us. Christ's full-time job right now is to pray for you. Wow, that's comforting. To think that he spends his time interceding before the Father for you and me. Wow. He is God's appointed judge. I'll pray a verse on that. Jesus is whom the believer has trusted for his salvation. He's the one who died more than that he was raised to life, who is the right hand of God. And the verses are manifold. We don't have to budge on this one further. But he is also, along with all that, presently full-time in prayer for us, interceding for us. So it, 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 he justified the ungodly. God will not and cannot contradict himself by charging them with evil. That's what Romans 4 said back there. And he, what Romans 8 is re, re, raising the issue here is who is he that condemneth? And Paul gives him four answers, each of which are taught elsewhere in the scripture, but they're gathered here to underscore the unconditional security of the believer. Christ died, he is risen, he, he advocates, and he intercedes. Those are the four reasons. And Christ is effective in all four of those. If God has already justified the man who believes in Jesus, how can he lay anything to the charge of his already justified one? He can't. His justification comes from the imputed righteousness of Christ and is legally ours. We, may, we don't deserve it, but we've got it stamped, our passport stamped, in effect. Justification is not the subject of merit. It cannot be lost by demerit. If you didn't earn it in the first place, you can't unearn it. Like a father, God can and does correct his earthly sons, but they always remain sons. You and I may be taken to the woodshed for something we've done, but we're still his son. The prodigal son's the example. He blew his inheritance, but he was still welcome back because he never lost his sonship is the point. Luke 15, if you want to dig into it. Who can condemn us if the penalty has already been paid? Double jeopardy, huh? The greatest proof of eternal security is the justification by faith. Your justification by faith passages lock that down. Justification refers to how God sees us. And no one else. It doesn't matter how they see us. That's the way God sees us. It's innocent. It's entirely. Justification is a legal matter. A forensic matter entirely. Remember Colossians 2.14. The, 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 the Tetelestai. The handwritings. Paid in full. We went through all that before. The redemption is eternal. And once and for all. According to Hebrews 9 and 10. And that hammers it. Depends on God the Son because of his substitutionary life and also because we can go through all of those again. Romans 5 ha hammered that. Now also his present session of course is advocate and intercessor. He's our legal advocate. Now Arminians fear that this kind of a doctrine will lead towards sin. But John says it's a motivation not to sin in 1 John 2. He's our priestly intercessor and Hebrews 7 says he saves to the uttermost. He not only is praying for us Hebrews tells us it's effective. <laughs> we are truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. He's not like Aaron. He's after the Melchizedek here. Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Wow. 
Well, the third party that is the basis of our eternal security, I haven't even mentioned yet, that's the Holy Spirit. He has a ministry of regeneration. That's all through the scripture. He has a ministry of his baptizing ministry. And don't confuse that with the water. That's symbolic. We went through that in Romans 6. And upon his sealing ministry. We need to talk a little bit about sealing. People misunderstand that. First, Second Corinthians, excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 says, speaking of the Holy Spirit, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. What are you talking about? Well, the earnest is a pledge, an araban. It's a legal concept. It's the first installment with which a man secures a legal claim upon a thing as yet unconsummated. You go to store and pay a down payment for something, they can't sell it to somebody else. You see, you got your down payment down. That's the, that's the concept. It's a down payment or a deposit or a pledge. It's evidence of good faith. It's obligating the party to consummate the thing involved. I put my down payment. I shall have to perform the rest, yes, but they can't slip out from under. It's the concept. That's the legal concept. The Holy Spirit himself is designated here as the down payment. He's the thing that's the earnest. He's the down payment. A first fruits to be followed by more, according to Romans 8, verse 23. You and I are sealed unto that day by what? By the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now the sealing part of this, if any one person who is born again in Christ ever fails to enter heaven when he dies, if that should happen, then God will have broken his pledge. Do you think he's going to do that? No way. No way. No conditions are mentioned. It's a work of God and depends upon him alone. And that's what the book of Galatians is all about from end to end. Now let's look at a few more here in Ephesians 1. In whom we also trusted after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the, that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of glory. Same concept we found in 2 Corinthians 1, but you, it's, 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 let's go to Ephesians 4.30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. By the way, that, that way you know the Holy Spirit must love you. You can't grieve somebody that doesn't love you. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. That's powerful language. The word sealing, sorgesio, is a, is a seal of protection. It was what they did to the, on the tomb of Christ in Matthew 27, seal of ownership. Uh, when the Holy Spirit seals, it's like a signet ring of the Father on hearts of wax. <laughs> I read that. I couldn't resist throwing that in there. But he leaves, he leaves the mark of his ownership. A broken seal is an indication that the protection wasn't adequate. Do you think the seal of the Holy Spirit is going to be adequate? I would say so. Can you break the seal? You think Satan can break that seal? I don't think so. Okay, we've got the last couple of questions to wrap it up. Then what kind of assurance can we have of victory then? We've, opposition can't defeat us. We'll have the resources. Our failures can't reverse things. No one condemn us for any reason. Great, okay. What kind of assurance do we have for victory? Okay, this is where Paul wraps it up. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Seven setbacks laid out here. Seven setbacks that you might experience. And Paul, by the way, experienced all of these. He talks about them in 2 Corinthians 11. Tribulation. What do we mean? Pressure, distress, whatever. Tribulation, distress, narrowness, being pressed in, hemmed in, crowded, persecution. That's being chased or persecuted. The New Testament always refers, in reference to the gospel, by the way, famine occurs 12 times in the New Testament. The God of Elijah looks after his own. Nakedness, 1 Corinthians 4, peril, jeopardy. Eight times in just one verse, by the way, in 2 Corinthians 11. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. Yes, the world hates the saints, so we can expect the sword too. As is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are, what? More than conquerors through him that loved us. Indeed. In all these adversities we are more than conquerors. See, rather than being separated from Christ's love, believers are more than conquerors. That's the present tense. They keep on being conquerors to a greater degree is what the Greek implies. Keep on winning a glorious victory is what it implies. Through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, Paul continues, that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers, those are ranks of angels, by the way, 
principalities and powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is Christ Jesus our Lord. The, the chapter opened with a guarantee of no condemnation. It closes with a guarantee of no separation. Incredible, incredible thing. That's his final guarantee. Angels, principalities, demons, powers of darkness. What else is there? What else is there? You know, this chapter should help us reprioritize everything in our lives. Everything in our lives. John tells us in there's one of my favorite verses in 1 John 3, 2. I've got to stick it in here. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Most people read that, they don't understand what it's saying. We're not going to see a representation of what he is. A photograph is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional person. We're not going to see a three-dimensional representation of a ten-dimensional person, or whatever. No, we shall see him as he really is. Not a, he, he's not a, not a three-dimensional of an n-dimensional thing, but because as he really is, we will be like him. Whatever dimensionality he apparently enjoys, this implies we will have that same capability. That's astonishing. Let me finish with just a little tour de force that I usually use when I wrap up something like this. I want to talk about the coming king from a broader perspective. Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about him a little bit. You know, it's funny, uh, with election year coming up, I'll be getting invited, uh, maybe, to some uh, prayer breakfast and so forth. They never invite me back. They'll invite me once, and that doesn't. Because I explain that I'm not a Republican or Democrat. I'm a monarchist. Let me tell you about my candidate. He's a, king of, he's a racial king. Everybody gasps. I say, yeah, he's, he's Jewish. He's the king of the Jews. In fact, he's a national king. He's king of Israel. In fact, he's king of all the ages, king of heaven, king of glory, and king of kings, and lord of lords. And the question is, do you know him? I mean, do you really know him? That's the question tonight. He's a prophet before Moses, a priest after Melchizedek, a champion like Joshua, an offering in the place of Isaac, a king from the line of David, a wise counselor above Solomon, a beloved, rejected, then exalted son like Joseph, but yet much more. The heavens declare his glory, and the firmament shows his handiwork. He who is, who was, and always will be, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the Alpha and the Tau, the A and the Z. He was the first fruits of them that slept. He's the ego I me, the yachach asher yachach, the I am that I am. Yes, he was the voice of the burning bush. He is the captain of the Lord's host. He was the conqueror of Jericho. Joshua 5, read it. It wasn't Joshua, it was Jesus. Uh, in fact, he's also enduringly strong, entirely sincere, eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful, imperially powerful, impartially merciful. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the very God of very God. He is our kinsman redeemer, but he's also our avenger of blood. In fact, he's also our city of refuge. He's our performing high priest, our personal prophet, our reigning king. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of theology, and yet he's the supreme problem in higher criticism. In fact, he's the miracle of all the ages, the superlative of everything good. You and I are beneficiaries of a love letter that was written in blood on a wooden cross erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. He was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. By him were all things made that were made. Without him was not anything that was made. And by him are all things held together. What held him to that cross? It wasn't the nails. At any time he could have said, enough already, I'm out of here. What held him that cross? It was his love for you and me. It caused him to endure to the end. He was born of a woman so that you and I could be born again. He humbled himself so that we could be lifted up. He became a servant so that we could become joint heirs with him. He suffered rejection so that we could become his friends. He denied himself so that we could freely receive all things. He gave himself so that he could bless us in every way. He's available to the tempted and tried. He blesses the young. He cleanses the lepers. He defends the feeble. He delivers the captives. He discharges the debtors. He forgives the sinners. He franchises the meek. He guards the besieged. He heals the sick. He provides strength to the weak. He, he regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. He serves the unfortunate. He sympathizes and he saves. His offices are manifold. His reign is righteous. 
His promises are sure. His goodness is limitless. His light is matchless. His grace is sufficient. His love never changes. His mercy is everlasting. His word is enough. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's irresistible. He's invincible. The heaven of heavens cannot contain him. Man cannot explain him. Pharisees couldn't stand him, but finally couldn't stop him. Pilate, the personal representative of the ruler of the world, couldn't find any fault with him. The witnesses couldn't agree against him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. The grave couldn't hold him. He has always been and always will be. He had no predecessor. He will have no successor. You can't impeach him. <laughs> he ain't going to resign. His name is above every name. That at the name of Yeshua, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. His is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, coming up for next session, the next three chapters are going to focus on Israel. I recommend you prepare all three. Chapter 9 has to do with Israel's past tense. Chapter 10, Israel present tense today. And chapter 11, Israel's future. Most churches do not realize Israel has a future, but that's exactly what Paul hammers away for three chapters that are coming up. Does God keep his promises is the central question. And who on earth are the metakoi? We're going to run into this strange word. We'll talk about that then. And what are the different kinds of inheritances? What are they? And what's the Bema seat really all about? So let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Well, Father, we, we just stagger as we realize the extremes that you've gone to on our behalf. We do thank you, Father, that before the foundation of the world that you have called us. We thank you for that calling, Father, and that predestination. We pray, Father, that we would do our part by being faithful, that we would avail ourselves of the resources you've placed at our disposal. We do pray, Father, that through your guidance and through the guidance of the Spirit that we would indeed accomplish that which you have called us to be and to do. We do pray, Father, that we might enter more fully into that relationship that you have established for us, that we might be more effective in our stewardship of the opportunities you placed before us. Oh, Father, we thank you for this incredible portion of your word. It just is overwhelming. So we just thank you, Father. We pray that through your spirit that you would help us be yours in every sense of that word. As we commit ourselves without any reservations whatsoever into the lordship of Yeshua, in whose name we do pray. Amen.